thank you so very much um, for that, Robert. Uh, it's obviously an extremely complex situation. Uh, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. I'm absolutely glad you brought up the question of finance in particular. Uh, because so much of the discussion has been about merchandise trade, you know, NAFTA and TPP and so on, uh, which are obviously or Brexit and so on. But the fact of the matter is, as, as you point out, this tremendous house of cards on top of it all. It, I mean, I think the currency trading, the daily currency trading is like $4 trillion per day. I mean, this do off this nonsense that, you know, people talking about, about NAFTA, Mexico, and so on and so forth. I mean, you figure four trillion a day just in currency trading, and we're losing the broader picture of the situation when we don't we don't see the totality of it. So thank you so very much. There's so many issues here. You throw it. I noticed you threw in a nice little point at the end there, which undoubtedly will come back to the point, just in case anybody missed it. <laughs> right? The point, the question, and I got it that was raised is whether, from the point of view of the left. We should confine our solutions to tinkering in the market. The question that is raised is whether, from the left, the solution should now begin to contemplate moving beyond the purely market sphere. That's the issue that has been raised here. And this is, I know, an elephant, this is absolutely taboo, but you never ever raise this. This is a dreadful thought. Well, that's the thought. Right? Can, can so, I just, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> can't resist. One little sure. addition. American workers, especially these famous white workers, have been, since for 50 years, this is how their wages have gone, like that. Not, not like that, but down. So what that means is the American working class hasn't had a raise in half a century. I'm not joking. <laughs> That's where they are. So... And this is, follows from this economy that is barely growing. So what I would say is, why don't we stop shilly-shallying around? There's no reason, there's no justification. Hillary Clinton is not going to be able to give you a good argument on why we need to, why we need to stick with capitalism. I don't think it's just saying that's not getting us beyond capitalism, getting us to socialism. But it frees us up to, you know, to cease to kind of worship at that totem and opens up uh, uh, what I could say, say is the path of struggle in which there is some different conclusion. And I think it's been exceedingly difficult for us to struggle without a different conclusion. And in a certain way, none of us believe in Tina, but Tina has been strangling us. Thanks very much. David? Okay. Um, there are a lot of uh, things where I, I overlap very much with what uh, Bob was saying, some places where I don't, you know, but we're good Marxists, we know how to fight each other, so <laughs> that'll be good. Um, I had a, a, a very... I had a, a, I had a very uh, interesting um, moment earlier this week uh, I did an interview last June or July, I think it was, uh, with a Turkish uh, journal, and they finally uh, translated it into Turkish, and uh, they uh, sent, said it's finally there, but there's something we've got to ask you, because back then, when we asked you about Trump, um, uh, you said uh, you thought it very plausible that Trump would actually become President of the United States. Uh, and I said that at, the, at that time, I'd actually forgotten I'd said that back then. But they then said, so at the time we didn't ask you because we thought they were so daft that anybody would think such a thing. Uh, but why did, you, why did you say that? And so I said, well, uh, to me it was actually a rather simple kind of argument uh, at the time. Uh, and I said, uh, in the 17 Contradictions book, I had written about three dangerous contradictions. The first was uh, the relation to nature, which is uh, climate change, habitat destruction, all the rest of it. Uh, the second was uh, compound growth, compound growth forever, 
which uh, is impossible when it gets to the point of inflection where it starts to, the exponential starts to, to leap. And we were at that point in the history of capitalism. And I said, the third is universal alienation. And I said, uh, back last summer, if I thought about the kinds of places I visited, and the kinds of people I talked to, and the kinds of things I was hearing, it seemed to me that there was a condition of massive, massive alienation in populations. And uh, the alienation was uh, uh, in relationship to the labor process. There was a poll that came out by Pew about people's satisfaction and 70% of the people interviewed said they either hated their job or they had no interest in it whatsoever. So it wasn't simply there was no jobs, it was there were no meaningful jobs. So alienation of that sort was there. People were alienated from the political process. Uh, people were, were alienated from what they felt uh, was uh, an excessive regulatory kind of uh, environment. And, you know, the right talks about this, but I, but I think all of us, uh, you know, in education, I've been in CUNY for 15 years, and frankly, the amount of bullshit pieces of paper you have to fill out and send back and little tests you have to take to show that you don't murder people in your office, <laughs> things like that. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, it's insane, you know. And at a certain point, you kind of feel, you know, I'm, I'm not alienated in my job. I love being here, but there's all this alienating stuff going on around you all the time, which is, and it's growing, growing. And, and everybody, if you say to them, you know, well, uh, do you like having a conversation about your telephone bill? Do you like having conversation with your uh, health insurance company and so on? The levels of bureaucratic nonsense and so on, so people kind of uh, are feeling that there's something grossly wrong with the way the state apparatus is working, and the state apparatus increasingly moves from trying to help people to being punitive. There's a wonderful movie just come out in Britain called I, Daniel Blake, which is about somebody's encounter with the welfare services in Britain and the total punitive activity of the state apparatus. It's an incredible movie by Ken Loach. And, 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 uh, you know, and then you look at it and you say, are the police uh, helping us or are they you know, being violent with us? And for large segments of the population, it's also... Okay. So when you started to think about alienation uh, uh, across the board, you'd find it everywhere. And you'd find it not only in production, you'd find it in consumption, you'd find it in daily life. And then if you kind of looked and said, well, where are all the protest movements going on right now? Well, you know, something goes bad in London and soon there's a riot and people are burning down the streets and, you know, the same thing happens in Stockholm. In Gezi Park, people erupt and so on. And these are not labor struggles of the classic sort. These are people, outbreaks and, and, and cause of Brazil in June 20, uh, 2013. These, these are, not, these, these are uh, outbreaks of discontent, massive discontent of alienated people who are alienated with daily life, no matter whether it's in the, pop, in, in the living space or the workspace or, 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 or wherever. And, and it, it, it seemed to me that in the, with the state of alienation, people respond politically uh, by either being sort of uh, passive and feeling un dis unempowered or, as in, say, the London riot, something comes up and there's this outbreak of kind of violent rage. And you want to do something, you want to destroy something, you want to tear it down. And, and it seemed to me there was a lot of that mood around, and it didn't surprise me when there was Brexit, didn't surprise me with Trump, doesn't surprise me with the kinds of movements that we're, 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 we're seeing. So with mass alienation of this kind, somebody like Trump could come along, but why, why Trump? And I thought to myself, you know, he has a very simple argument he can make to you know, the mythical white uh, worker in uh, Ohio, which would be this. I'm a businessman, and I'm a highly successful businessman, he would say. I've made a lot and lot of money, and I'm spending my money on running for an election so I can give voice to your discontents. That's what he would say. And he'd say, but look at who my opponent. My opponent went into politics to make money. And she's been making money hand over fist in politics. Look at that money she got from Goldman Sachs. 
250,000. I'm still waiting for an invitation, by the way. <laughs> $250,000 for a lecture, you know, I'd do it for half that if Goldman really wanted. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, we could, uh, I'd contribute you, it to the CUNY Graduate 92. Center. You've got to yeah. have 92 lectures uh, yeah, okay. in two years. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so he'd make that argument and, and, and some guy sitting on a bar stool and having a chat in, 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 in Ohio would kind of say, I don't trust that woman. I, I trust this guy. I mean, I mean he's spending his money on, on, on this. And, and I think that was a very compelling argument, and I think it sort of stuck throughout. And there were other issues involved, but this brings me back, however, to, 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 to the alienation. And where the alienation is coming from, and, you know, it certainly does come in lots of ways for what's going on in the economy. And I'll agree with some of the things that Bob has to say, uh, except I never like this falling rate of profit. Uh, and stuff. Uh, that's a kind of, but we can have a little separate argument about that. But I think that there's a number of things going on. Certainly, I think that in the terms of organisation of production and manufacturing and all the rest of it, what what's happened has, of course, been a massive technological change. And the technological change has also allowed uh, you to set up a commodity chain structures. So it's perfectly possible right now for all of the sort of sophisticated engineering, design, uh, innovation, all of those kinds of things, and even marketing and so on, uh, to be located in the United States while uh, there is a production uh, going on somewhere, somewhere else. In other words, you split the, the whole organization. And an obvious thing would be the relationship between the uh, United States and Mexico. And we're seeing the emergence of these regional configurations. And the point about Mexico is that you could have the assembly line across the border in Ciudad Juarez, and you can have your, 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 your research organization and your headquarters in Dallas. And, and this works extremely well, because you combine the skills that come out of what exists in the United States, uh, which is uh, a, 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 a skilled labor force and a skilled entrepreneurial kind of structure, you can combine that with Mexican labor, which means you just cut out American labor. So American labor is hollowed out. So I think that the argument that Trump makes about that is to some degree correct, uh, that NAFTA was very good at doing that. It's not only NAFTA, you see, because the Germans do this with Poland. And there are these regional configurations emerging where you know, you've got these, these sorts of things being set up in this kind of way, where the cheap labor's over here and the, 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 something else. The, 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 the. So, so these things are now uh, possible through information and tech, uh, technologies. And as we get uh, to even further down the line, uh, to artificial intelligence and all the rest of it, it may be possible to control a production line in Mexico by sitting at your desk in Dallas. And, and so those things are going on, and, and that means there's a very rapid reconfiguration of the global workforce and how the global workforce is being employed and, and the like. And so that uh, privileged workforces that had privileges in the past, uh, when actually the nation state still protected you against, as it were, workforces from other nation states, which existed in the 1960s, that got eroded through neoliberalism and, and, but now it's got, it got eroded even further through the kinds of technologies that allow uh, for, these, uh, uh, for these connections uh, uh, to be made. And, and that, of course, then leads to the fact that, you know, the jobs do disappear. And, 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 and to some degree, the argument that they all go to Mexico is, is, is correct. And so there is a, a sort of an interesting way in which you then start to re-ask re what NAFTA is about and what the TPP is about. Um, the idea that that was about, is about free trade is nonsense. It's about, you know, try, it's about the United States trying to create a privileged uh, production, marketing, organizational sphere which is antagonistic to China and Europe. In other words, what we're seeing is the regionality, creating a regional configurations uh, of uh, production and organization of production uh, in this way. And what each, any big state tries to do is to create something like that when they have this privilege and, and then they, they uh, actually um, 
uh, benefit immensely from that organization. But the working people don't, of, of the United States don't benefit from it any more than the working people of Germany benefit from, from the sort of organization that exists in the European Union. I mean, it seems to me there's a hegemon, if you want to put it that way, within the European Union, which is Germany. Germany has benefited a great deal from the construction of the Eurozone, and we know perfectly well who has not benefited from it. And, and they've had their values sucked dry, as it were, by Germany. And the US was trying to set up something like the Trans-Pacific Agreement in order to do the same in that kind of area. And I think it's a very interesting that since it's been sort of suggested that that whole thing is dead, who's stepping in to construct something along similar lines? Well, China, of course. So you see these kinds of things going on in the realm of, of manufacturing and production. But where I, but where I think it, it's, uh, you know, what, what this does, of course, is to create a reconfiguration of how labor, the, labor, the world's labor force is being, being set up. And, the, and, and the, the problem here is that the rate of change is very fast. Now, if you sort of, sort of said, well, you know, once upon a time, textile mills were in Lowell, Massachusetts, and then they went to the Carolinas, and then they went to Mexico, and then they, you know, that took about 30 or 40 or 50 years for all of that process to go on. But what we're seeing is a compression, and this is typical of this kind of uh, second contradiction I talk about, which is the acceleration which is going on, that these, this acceleration means that the thing goes much faster and it's therefore much harder to adapt to and therefore you've got recalcitrant populations who suddenly find themselves bereft where they thought they had advantages, they suddenly disappear. And so I think again one of the things we're seeing is a speed up of these processes. But I don't think uh, the world's labor force has, has shrunk. In fact, uh, if you look at the data, uh, the world's labor force since 1980, wage labor force since 1980, has increased by one billion. Uh, it's gone from two billion to three billion. Uh, what's happened is that the whole of China's come in, all of Indonesia, large segments of India, and all the rest of it. And so we've now got industrialization going on at a very merry clip in all of those countries. And so there's an expansion of manufacturing in those, in those countries. Uh, and a and, uh, movement uh, of manufacturing to uh, you know, Bangladesh and all the rest of it. But again, there's something very unusual about this, which is that for the first time, industrialization doesn't necessarily push you up the uh, GDP ladder. In fact, industrialization uh, very often now is, is, is helps, it's one of those forces that doesn't, doesn't push you down, but it doesn't, go, it doesn't take you very far. Uh, and there's a very simple reason for that, because again, it goes back to the way the, the organization is set up. But if you look at um, uh, something like uh, Apple Computer, Apple Computer uh, in this country uh, has a very high rate of profit. Its rate of profit is around 28% last time I checked it out in the New York, in the, in the Financial Times. Uh, Shenzhen, Foxconn, that makes the computers, what's their rate of profit? 3%. So actually you've got a big gap between where the profit is created, where the value is created, which is in Shenzhen, and where it's realized. It's realized in the United States and it's produced uh, there. So again, we've got to look very carefully at the relationship between production and realization. And we've also got to understand that a lot of the struggles that are going on these days are at the point of realization, not at the point of production. So there, 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 there are all sorts of uh, issues and the struggles that occur at the point of realization have a different structure from those that occur at the point of production. Because, as Marx pointed out, the worker, when they are uh, at the point of realization, uh, they are actually buyers. And so the relationship is between buyers and consumers, and it's not the same as, as between capital and labor. And in fact, uh, the kinds of struggles that go on at the point of realization have a completely different configuration of terms of population. Like if there is a struggle against rising rents, for example, then uh, you've got all kinds of people who are becoming involved in that, not just simply uh, you know, workers, it's uh, you know, middle class people and, 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 and the like. Because everybody's affected by, for example, the way in which property prices in this city are, are surging upwards. And if we wanted to have a movement against uh, the rising rents and rising property prices in this place, then, well, well 
we would, we would have many people from many different backgrounds and from many different class positions who would join in that, that struggle, we would have, have a different kind of structure. And so if you ask who was on the streets in Brazil in, in, in June of 2013, or who took part in Gezi Park, and it was not classic working class, it was actually a whole mix, mixture of people, including middle, you know, disaffected, alienated, middle class uh, groups in the population who've been seeking to create, if you like, heterotopic spaces within the city where they could live an unalienated existence in a sea of alienation. I mean, those kinds of movements you see actually all over the place. So this is, uh, uh, I think, one of the points that I would, I would, I would really uh, want to, to make. But then I would want to go a bit further because I think that, um, I think it's, it's wrong uh, to stress too much the falling rate of profit. Uh, and, and I think that the question is, where is the profit being made? How is it being distributed? How is it being realized? Uh, and when you take all that into account, the, the data looks rather different than it typically does when you get bunches of data about what the corporations are doing. Um, for example, I don't see why it is, that, uh, using Marxist kind of language right now, that, that uh, the auto worker is somebody who is considered to produce value, but the person who makes hamburgers is not. In fact, the person who makes hamburgers is creating value. Now, who are the two, who used to be the biggest employers of labor in this country in the 1960s? It was General Motors and Ford and U.S. Steel. Who is it now? It's McDonald's and it's, uh, you know, Kentucky Walmart. Fried Chicken and Walmart. And, and so actually what you've got is, you know, and now how do you find out the rate of profit in the restaurant industry of Manhattan? I don't know what the aggregate rate of profit is. I really don't. I don't think anybody knows. So I think there's a kind of lot of value that's being created uh, in urban settings, which is of this sort, which is not which is not captured in a lot of the data on profit rates from corporations and all the rest of it that that uh, that, that that people use. I mean, if I stand at the corner of uh, 86th Street and Second Avenue and look at what's going on, I see I see restaurants there. I, I see. Uh, uh, you know, logistics, by the way, is a big area of uh, profit making, and that's very profitable. As for, you know, and and, and, and the like. Uh, anybody who engages in transportation is is value creating. Uh, Marx's categorizations, uh, so that uh, you know, and you see somebody's putting up scaffolding on one side of the street. Uh, that's value creating, and somebody's taking it down on the other side of the street. That's value creating. I mean, there's there's a huge amount. A value creation just going on around you or in the city, but it's the thing is it's not in a factory, it's not easily identified. It's actually a very fluid kind of local, small scale, a lot of insecure labour, and, and of course the labour supply is precarious and has got used to being precarious. And this is kind of an interesting thing about the culture of young people in terms of their relationship to job opportunities. Uh, you know, they go and work in a coffee bar and they're there for six months and then they, one day they just say, oh, I'm not bothering anymore, and they go somewhere else. And, 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 and this, you know, from, from sort of perspective, my perspective, that, that, that's a terrible situation, but a lot of them seem, a lot of kids I know seem to like it. And I say, this is great, you know, I mean, I just go off, I, you know, I've got enough money now, I can spend a few weeks, uh, you know, trolling around doing what I want, and then I'll go to another coffee bar somewhere or I'll... I'll go pick up some other job somewhere for a little while. So, so, so people are getting used to a precarious, uh, peripatetic kind of uh, lifestyle uh, around, around, around job markets. Um, so this is, these, are, these, are, these are sorts of things that are, that are, that are going on. Now, in, in the way I set up my, my, the way I analyze things, I, I like to think about the circulation of capital as a whole, as a totality. And there are three key moments in the circulation of capital. One is the moment of production, and then there's a the moment of, of realization, and then there's a the moment of distribution. And capital circulates through all of those moments. And then you ask yourself the question, what's the driving force that keeps circulation moving? What is it? The classic way to look at this is to say, well, it's the, it's the incentive of individual capitalists or capitalist corporations to get profit. That is, you look at the moment of production, say people go, start with a certain amount of money, 
Then they end up the day with more money and they do it by going through production and, and employing labour and getting surplus value out of the labour and extracting value from labour and they, they get to the point of, of, of realisation. So this is one place where, this is one way in which the drive is there, that the capitalist is in there and they're going to push the system because they're, they're profit seeking and, and the like. But what happens if there's no profit there? Well, the answer to that is, as, as, as Bob has pointed out, is the Keynesian solution, is, which is that somebody steps in and says, all right, we'll create the demand so that you can get your profit, and we create that through state expenditures. But where does the state expenditures come from? Well, they're going to have to come out of uh, actually borrowing money, deficit finance, all this kind of thing. So, but you can imagine then that there, is, there, there are organisations who are busy sort of pushing the system by creating demand as much as possible. And I think that that is another source, if you like, of the energy that runs into the capital accumulation system. The third source is uh, what occurs at the moment of distribution. A lot of people have surplus money. And at the point of distribution, they want to put that somewhere and they want it to earn something. Uh, so, just to take an example, um, a pension fund. I have a pension fund. I'm in TIA. And I, I, there's, there's the pension money, and what do I do? Put it in a pension fund and nothing happens to it? No, I expect the pension fund to make some money out of it. So I want TIA to, to actually push the system. Uh, and, and, and how does it push the system? It goes out and it offers credit to somebody. It, it, it markets debt, if you like, and says, OK, you can borrow money, but, I, but what is debt? It's a claim on future labour. It's not a claim on present labour, it's a claim on future labour. And basically my pension fund in five years' time depends upon the future labour five years' time which is being brought back by my pension fund. So there's pension funds, and then there's the stockholders, and then there's the bondholders, and then there's the, the banks themselves who have money. So they're sitting there and all of them want a rate of return. And they're going to push the system as much as they can. And Historically, I'd like to suggest this, that initially, yeah, the first, the, the, the capitalist seeking profit was, 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 was important. In the 1930s, that began to break down, and so you get the Keynesian thing for a while. Right now, who's the energy behind the whole system? It lies in the field of distribution. That is, it's the people of distribution who are creating the debt, who are actually pushing, therefore. Now, debt has to be redeemed. And it can only be redeemed through some form of activity which is going to, you know, give me my 5% or whatever I expect to get on my pension fund. So, so this redemption of the debt means that value has to be created somewhere else within the system in order to redeem the debt. Now, how is that done? Well, of course, one of the ways in which it can be done is to borrow more debt, in which case you've got a Ponzi scheme. But there's something else which goes on in the debt thing, which I think is terribly important, which is that debt forecloses, and I think the relationship between foreclosure and all those things is important. Debt forecloses the future in certain ways. That is, you are bound some, in some way by the assumption of debt. And as a result of that, this is a form of social control, and it's a key form of social control which most people are suffering under. That is, what is being produced is a society which is based on debt peonage. And everybody, I think, understands that. And the system understands it very well, because when, for example, mortgage finance was set up in the 1930s, there's this famous line, debt-encumbered homeowners don't go on strike. Debt-encumbered students, they don't go out there and, you know, create a ruckus. You know. So actually, the whole kind of debt structure is now actually what is completely involved. And there was this wonderful moment, which I always like to go back to, when Clinton won the first election, and he sort of was talking about his economic program, and Rubin said, you can't do that, and, and Clinton said, why not? He said, well, Wall Street bondholders, etc., won't let you. And you know, Clinton's famous response was, well, do you mean to say my whole economic program is held hostage? to a bunch of fucking bond traders. And Robert Rubin said, yes. 
And so Clinton came in promising us universal health care. What did he give us? He gave us NAFTA, he gave us the reform of the welfare as we know it, he gave us a criminal justice system reform, which was uh, highly, uh, you know, so it was quite, really quite vicious, and the, the, the re eventually repealing Glass-Steagall. So, and that was what the bondholders said. Now there's a big question mark, right? Who's in charge of the damn system, the politicians or the bondholders? And I think the answer is, you look at Greece and all the rest of it, it's the bondholders. The bondholders, and I, by that I mean my pension fund as well, you know, are, are all part of this. Now, what this means is there's an acceleration, there is a growth of indebtedness. And the important thing about this is that that's the only form of capital that can increase without limit, without any limit whatsoever. Other things increase, but then have a limit. For example, I, I really have to always put this in because it always completely blows my mind. China in two years consumed 45% more cement than the United States consumed in the whole 100 years before that. Three years. Three. Well, it depends where you start. I mean, this is, this, is, this is huge, and, this, and what's happened in China is absolutely astonishing. This is where I sort of depart a little bit from Bob's picture, because China in 2007 had zero miles of high-speed train network. It now has 12,000 miles. And why did it do that? Well, because it needed to get out there and employ labor. When its export industries crashed in 2008, because the US consumer market crashed, what happened? Chinese had to find some way to employ 20 million people. They, they lost 20 million jobs in 2008. And by the end of 2008, they had actually had a net job loss, according to the IMF, of 3 million. That is, they, 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 they created 17 million jobs in about nine months. How did they do it? They built the high-speed rail networks, they built the high-speed, they built highways, they built whole new cities. They consumed, they consumed half, more than half of the world's cement, uh, more than half of the world's steel, about 60% of the world's copper during this whole period. Commodity prices went up, and those countries that were producing, you know, raw materials for China came out of the 2007-2008 uh, collapse pretty well. Australia came out pretty well. Chile came out very well. Why? Because China said, send us, send us the ore, send us the copper, send us the, you know, the lithium, send us whatever. We need it, we need it, we need it. But there's a limit on how much cement you can damn well consume. I mean, when you start to think of an exponential growth of their use of cement that way, you kind of, it's pretty terrifying. But one of the consequences of this was that the Chinese actually went from relatively low debt to GDP ratio to a very high debt to GDP ratio. So they're heavily, heavily in debt. They've gone into the, 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 the debt creation game. Now, there's, this is, this is uh, I think probably, I mean, what Bob was getting to at the end of the other side of this bit of paper. You can't see it. This is, this is, the, this is a graph of total debt. Uh, this is, the IMF has just come up with the total debt in the world from, you know, back when. Uh, and, and around 1970, look what does it do? It takes off like this, goes crazy like that. It's on an expansion, exponential curve. It's a little blip, 2008, where it kind of goes down like this and then it jumps up again. This is, this, is, this is Ponzi finance in action. This is debt peonage in action. And everybody knows that it's experts in the manipulation of debt peonage who come out with all the money and experts in debt peonage who are going to manage the economy. And it's so fascinating that the two guys that Trump has appointed to, are exactly people in the debt peonage business. What 
What, what did they do? Where did they get their money from? Yeah. Both of them got it by taking over a lousy bank, you know, evicting people. So and this is not a labor problem, this is kind of you're evicting people from the house. You've got the foreclosure stuff. You know. and, and nobody kind of checks out a little bit about you know, how, how many people got foreclosed upon and what impact that had in terms of the alienation of populations from what damn country are we living in that does that? You know. So, so it gets me back to kind of, you know, the, the, the deep discontent with this, with this system. And I think we're going to see a revolt at some point against debt peonage. And I'm surprised in some ways that the student debt thing didn't morph into a massive kind of, kind of movement, but it's actually very difficult to get out of it. For a very simple reason, that if you had a moratorium on debt or a jubilee or whatever they would like to say, and therefore you wiped it all out, you'd wipe out my pension fund. <laughs> so you can't do that. This is what I mean by debt peonage. You are locked in. You've got to support the system, because if you don't support the system, you are screwed. And then they do all kinds of weird, weird things like, I actually have, you know, if I, took, if, if I took all the money out of my pension fund or took a large chunk of it out of the pension fund and got rid of my mortgage debt, wouldn't that be a sensible thing to do? Yeah, it would be a very sensible thing to do, except all of the taxation arrangements and everything else make it almost, you know, uneconomic to do it. So the system gets structured in such a way as to lock us in to debt peonage. And that seems to me to be where the major forms of alienation are coming from. And I think that that is something which is all over Europe and it's everywhere. This seems to me to be something that the state as it's currently structured cannot deal with. Because, as Clinton said, they are dependent entirely on the power of the bondholders. And if they go against the power of the bondholders, in the same way if I go against the power of the bondholders and I you know, lose my pension, the state loses its finance. The state loses its power. So, so here you've got the nexus, what I call a state finance nexus, which is the crucible of power. And that crucible is one which has managed to, with all these tentacles, to lock us in. And the big, big question is how do we get out? And by what forms of social movement can we get out? There are individuals, and I've said, there are lots of heterotopic kind of spaces emerging in urban areas where people try and live and say, I'm not going to get into that debt economy, I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to find some other way to live. I'm not going to sort of be, get locked in in all these sorts of ways. But at that point, you have to understand that, that we are the problem, as well as them. In other words, it's not just them. We, in terms of what we do and how we do it and why we do it, we are caught in the trap. And until we understand that and say we have to get ourselves out of this trap, then it seems to me we're not going to be able to do anything further than keep on going with this huge Ponzi scheme where debt will be created without limit, money will be created without limit, people will use the circulation process in such a way to extract as much money, wealth and power as they can. And I think it's very, very emphatically the case, that since 2007-2008, almost all of the recovery has actually gone into the pockets of the top 1%. All of the data show that, right? Yep. And, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're doing fine. And in fact, we have an amazing situation where that capitalist class is doing extremely well while capital in general is doing very badly. We cannot expect that capitalist class to do anything about the situation. They have no incentive to do anything whatsoever about it. 
And many of us are also in a situation where we don't have an incentive to do too much about it because if we do, I lose my pension. Or I lose this, or I lose that. Lose my house, lose this. So this is the situation. But we have to, I think, understand and unlock the situation in order then to talk about what kinds of alternatives uh, might, might be there and how those alternatives might be, might, might be structured and set up. Let me leave it there, because I'm sure a lot of people have Thanks a lot of much. things to say. Thanks very much, David. Sorry to open to the floor and get questions and comments and read the news.